I don't want to say this is the highlight of the afternoon because that would suggest that not everything is a highlight, but it is, it is one of a series of five highlight programs that we have. Um, and I'm going to, uh, and it is, the, it is the program with private sector general counsels and I guess we call you the, the senior federal criminal prosecutor in the United States the Assistant Attorney General of the Criminal Division of the Justice Department. So these are good folks to, uh, to listen to. Um, and I'm going to introduce Leslie Caldwell, who is the head of the Criminal Division, and then uh, ask her to take it from there and introduce the rest of the panel. Um, Leslie, for those of you who don't know, um, is not only currently the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, a position that she has held since May of 2014, um, she also has a long history of public service and um, a leader in the, in the private bar as well. Um, the criminal division, she, which she heads uh, currently, has nearly 600 attorneys. They prosecute federal criminal cases across the country. Uh, they also develop criminal law and formulate uh, criminal law policy and, and criminal law proposals. Um, she works closely with the 93 U.S. Attorney's offices across the country, and, and as I sort of referred to earlier, to the extent in our system there is a senior federal criminal prosecutor in this country, it is Leslie Caldwell. Um, and among the things that she oversees is the computer crimes, intellectual property section, and uh, the cyber work that they do. Um, her past experience includes uh, serving as the director of the Enron Task Force and also as the chief of the criminal division and chief of the securities fraud section in the attorney's office in the Northern District of California, um, along with, as I mentioned earlier, a distinguished career as the head of the white collar uh, practice at, at Morgan Lewis, so one of the leading firms in this country. So uh, please welcome, join me in welcoming Leslie, and then I will let her welcome the panel. Thank you, Steve. So we're fortunate to have some great, knowledgeable, uh, in-house counsel here today. I think we're at a place where everyone in the country realizes the importance of getting good legal advice after you have an intrusion. What do you have to do? What do you have to disclose? Who do you have to report to? What do you do to interact with your regulators, with law enforcement, with other government agencies? Um, but the organizations that really are, are best positions to address a breach are the organizations who have things in place before the breach, who have a plan about what to do, long before an incident has occurred um, and are ready to leap into action and put their planning into action the minute that they're alerted that there's been a problem. Um, our panel consists of distinguished private sector attorneys from companies that handle and protect very different types of data. So we're lucky to have a folks from a cross section of companies here. Um, these are people who are very focused on the need to be prepared for a cybersecurity incident and the, the way to respond. So let me introduce each of the panelists. Um, starting on my right is Angie Chen, who's the Vice President, General Counsel, and Chief Compliance Officer at Siemens Government Technologies. Uh, then Chris, I'm sorry, then Carter Ludi, who's the Vice President of the Legal Division at Target Corporation. Then Chris Keyes at the far right, who's the Vice President and Deputy General Counsel for Compliance at Ethics and Ex at Exelon Corporation. So three very different types of companies with three very different types of data um, and presumably different strategies, which you'll hear about today. So I'd like to ask each person to talk very briefly about their company and what their role is. I'll start with you, Angie, and then we'll go down the line. Sure, thanks, Leslie. Um, so thanks very much for having me here. Uh, I do have to preface that my comments are mine alone, so uh, not necessarily those of my company, particularly since I just joined uh, Siemens Government Technology six months ago. Um, but I've spent about 20 years in-house and before that starting complex litigation. The last 15 years were primarily in deeply or on the fringes of the defense organizations, defense industry. Um, so SGT is actually a foci mitigated entity. We deal with classified programs and we also deal with those types of activities with the federal government on behalf of the entirety of Siemens, which is a multinational uh, global engineering company uh, with roughly 340,000 plus employees. Um, so our mission essentially is to make sure that we can address the federal market and bring those types of products and services to the benefit of the U.S. government, and yet at the same time make sure that we are doing the appropriate thing with respect to managing and dealing with 
cyber issues as well as information. Carter. Uh, good afternoon again. Thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, I hope that most folks out in the audience are familiar with Target Corporation. If, if you're not, I'll be passing out red card applications <laughs> as you leave. That, um, at the time of our breach event, I was uh, charged with the responsibility of uh, coordinating and executing the legal response, amongst other things. And turns out public speaking is part of that 12-step rekeying your mental health after <laughs> a breach that I'm now engaged in. Um, Target's got a long history of trying to work into better communities, and the information security space is no different. Our chief information security officer is very active in both the private sector and the government sector in terms of trying to uh, forward how we eventually solve cybersecurity writ large. And frankly, I'm hoping to this afternoon um, share lessons learned outside of the best practices that um, are proliferating in terms of things that the government's um, doing. So I'm looking forward to the, the discussion and your questions later. Chris? Thank you, and I appreciate the uh, opportunity to, to join the panel as well. Uh, Exelon Corporation is one of the largest integrated electric and gas utility companies in the country. Uh, we are headquartered in Chicago. Uh, we own uh, generation assets that produce power via uh, nuclear fission. Uh, we own a very large renewables portfolio, uh, and we deliver power to uh, end users, to all of our customers, in a variety of settings. So. Uh, our role as, as part of the critical infrastructure of the nation uh, is taken very seriously. And I think um, I, look forward to, I look forward to learning from the panelists as well, more, much more so than hear myself speak. So let's get to the heart of our conversation. And as Carter said last year, the criminal division was one of probably many government organizations that issued a best practices for cybersecurity guide. Um, I think what's clear from all of these guides that are coming out is that lawyers play a very critical role in preparing for um, cyber incidents, uh, making sure that the company is prepared uh, all the way to the response and the recovery. So I'd like to start with you, Angie, and ask you, what do GCs have to know and have to be doing before a cybersecurity incident occurs? Sure, so now that I'm with a German-owned company, it's probably fitting to start with the quote from the German military strategist, uh, Helmut von Molke, which is, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. Um, having said that, the worst thing to do, the, the one thing that's worse than not having a battle plan is having no plan at all. Um, so we were actually chatting a little bit prior to the panel about some of the things that in fact lawyers are extraordinarily good at, which is of course being able to react, being able to muster the resources, being able to take a problem set, dissect it, and figure out how to solve it and provide the right advice and counsel. Unfortunately, as you'll hear from some of my esteemed panelists uh, here, uh, that's really not very comforting when you're in the middle of an emergency or a breach. Um, so some of the things that are put forth in the best practices guide, which is absolutely phenomenal, lays out the key things that in fact general counsels, in fact the entire legal industry really should be keeping in mind, which is you need to have a plan. Today there is no excuse not to have thought about it and to have at least the best that you can do in terms of figuring out what and how are you going to operate and how are you going to respond and how are you going to manage all of your responsibilities on behalf of your stakeholders if and when a cyber breach happens. And it's pretty much a truism these days that it's not really a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And at that point in time, if you do not know, for instance, the things that are laid out in the best practices, where your key and most critical business critical and operationally critical information is, if you do not know who you need to call inside the company, who you need to inform, who you need to essentially enlist by way of partners, and that includes everybody from external consultants, outside counsel, the government, where appropriate, so that in fact, one, you can leverage the knowledge that you do have, know where in fact you need to get smarter really fast, three, to whom are you going to delegate the tasks that need to be done, four, make sure that in fact you're not missing any of the tasks, all on a multi-track response. If you do not have at least the vestige of a plan and all of those information and bits and pieces that lawyers are so good at putting together ahead of time, you will find yourself essentially flat-footed and unable to respond and you will miss things. And the consequence of that is the anathema for any lawyer, which is you will not be able to identify the risk and provide the appropriate advice and counsel and leadership within your organization 
in order to be able to respond appropriately. The consequences of that today are severe. For some companies, perhaps a little bit more than most. In a commercial sector, your business is going to be impacted. Your reputation is going to be impacted. For those of us that are in the defense industry, the stakes are even higher because the mission of the government customer and the nation are also potentially impacted if we do not essentially take those critical first steps, have the plan in place, test it, proof it, run through drills, whether it's in your head, communicate it out, make sure that you understand what's out there. The last point I'll add to this is that each one of us is incumbent. It used to be 10, 15, 20 years ago. You could afford to not be aware of this issue. But I gave two examples earlier where we know how to do this. And when we're forced to do it or when it's identified to us, we're really good at ma managing it. The first example was Y2K. The second one was e-discovery. But those were finite. They were complex, but they were finite problem sets with a timeline. In this instance, lawyers need to be proactive. You cannot wait for it to be packaged or given to you in terms of one set deadline or one set problem set to basically go out and tackle. You need to have a very holistic approach to this and understand all the possible variables and all the possible players with respect to how to get a good plan in place. So Carter, without getting into details about uh, uh, the data breach at Target, how did you get yourself up to speed and what do you recommend other people do to get themselves up to speed to be able to deal with what for many lawyers I think are very unfamiliar concepts? Well, uh, two things come to mind in particular just to add to what Angie was saying. One is the, the taxonomy that attaches to the in, uh, information security subject matter is very unfamiliar um, on, on a number of different levels. And so my point ultimately is you'll, it, 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 would, it would really benefit you, it would benefit, frankly, your senior executives to have some sort of a thought about a primer, some sort of how do you get yourself up to speed and at least understanding the vocabulary of the, of the information that you're going to be encountering. Um, I mean, when, when you're in the middle, if you were in the middle of our event and you heard, if, if that was the first time you heard attack vector, you are miles behind in terms of trying to understand what's happening and assess what sort of risk, what sort of threat, what sort of communications flow from that. The second is um, before and after we've done a lot of tabletop, a lot of war games, and I think that's essential, but the the, the, the lesson I keep trying to impart on our team, um, even today at Target, is we have to, because we've got a relatively new uh, C-suite, um, you have to engage, you have to understand in particular how, whether it's the CEO or whoever the, the prime decision maker is, and in our case it would be the CEO, if we had any, any sort of a significant uh, event again, how will they react? How do they want information? What's their level of confidence? Because I can, you know, back to no plan survives the, the first attack. Um, that was true for us. We had a plan, but it, and, and it didn't survive first impact. Um, but the reality is, is that, you know, when I'm asked this, and nobody asked the next question was, well, was that a good thing or a bad thing? In our case, it was a good thing. But, but our CEO had a management style that was really conducive to sort of a collaborative information gathering. So it made it... It accelerated our opportunity to make sure the key people within the organization knew and understood what was going on. But I'll go back to my first point. We were still hamstrung by, we had the right people. We felt like we were on top of things, but it was very difficult to understand the foreign language of cybersecurity and forensic evidence. And, and to, to build on that point, um, I think Gabe mentioned it in one of the earlier panels, particularly if you're inside counsel, it is imperative that legal is a participant in the security incident response team, imperative. That way you build the acumen that you're talking about, that way you can help to shape the company's response plans and ensure that they are consistent with any regulatory requirements for your sector. And likewise, uh, if an event occurs and we have the ability to attach privilege to the actual investigation, the business knows what to look for. They know because they've heard uh, you know, they've heard counsel describe what um, issues, what um, communication will come from legal to instruct them on how to conduct the investigation, how to communicate back to legal, et cetera. So I firmly believe that the most effective response plans have legal directly engaged in their creation. 
So I wanted to ask a question about resources because from the vantage point of the criminal division, uh, we see a lot of situations where companies um, kind of talk the talk but don't walk the walk on resources. So it's more in the compliance space, but we also see it to some extent in the cyberspace where companies may still not be devoting enough resources to cybersecurity and cyber response plans. And how, from anyone who wants to take this, how has your, from your vantage point, how has that evolved? And are most companies getting it at this point that this is really a critical thing that can be devastating to a company? So Leslie, I'll start off. Um, in, in late 2010, um, there was a recommendation from the National Infrastructure Advisory Council for the White House to convene a session with the energy sector. Uh, by mid-2012, I think the White House invited, emphasis on invited, uh, about a dozen or so CEOs across the nation to, to have a classified briefing on the intelligence. That was a game changer. When the CEOs went back to their organizations, the questions about resource allocation were completely erased because they understood the why behind the threat. So I do think that was a, a partnership opportunity with DOE, with DHS, that had a material impact on how CEOs responded. Larry? Well, I mean, I, I, I think our, our instance, uh, at least my experience at Target, probably is an outlier to some extent because, frankly, we've suffered a major breach event. And because of how notorious that was covered in the media and, frankly, what's happened to our company, both in terms of just raw sales and look at our structure today, there was significant um, significant outcomes, significant consequences. So there's no, um, there's not a resource issue. In fact, in, in our instance, frankly, it's quite the opposite. Um, we, 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 we will rise or fall on the level of trust that our guests impart, and forgive me for start slipping into target speak, but guests are customers. Um, we rise and fall on their trust in our company, and after we've sustained that breach, we have now, and we, we've accelerated our information security plan to be on the same level as the defense sector. And frankly, that's over-indexing, but that's where we find ourselves. So now it's not a question of do we, we dedicate the resources, but where do you draw that line on this cloudy world of the future of cybersecurity and threat activity that we see today? It's, it's very difficult. Angie, what do you view, um, and you can feel free to add to that if you like, but what do you view as the role that outside counsel can and should or should not play in helping you develop your cybersecurity response plan? And, and if you think they have a role, what do you expect them to do? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll leave my response um, as an add-on to what Chris and Carter were mentioning, which is, uh, to your first question, I think companies and, and industry and government are getting smarter. I think collectively we're getting far more aware. Part of that's driven by events. I mean, there, there's so much publicity for law firms, the Panama Papers, obvious uh, clarion call. If you didn't get the message before, you better get it now. Um, there's really no excuse. Um, same thing, there's any number of companies, uh, not just Target. He's not alone, right? There's a number of companies that have suffered very, very visible uh, data breaches, OPM. Uh, the issues with respect to the government. So I think my my information's been breached three times. <laughs> you know, I've, Minus but, five or six. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, you're a little bit ahead of me. So, um, so, so there's really no excuse. I think companies are getting smarter, and I think the truth is, is part of the challenge now is making sure that we get it all the way out to the edge. So any number of organizations like NACD, there is a campaign to make sure that boards and directors are aware of what they need to be savvy about and what they need to do in order to affect their duties. I think law firms, same thing. You need to understand you operate as a business. You also operate as a service provider. Companies, same thing. It's all about understanding the operational and business DNA, whatever your organization may be, be you government, private sector, or somewhere in between. Because don't forget the academic, uh, academic community as well. Um, everyone's got their idiosyncrasies, but the message is the same. With respect to outside counsel, realize the different roles that you play, right? So whether you're an associate, whether you're a managing partner, whether you essentially are the relationship manager, understand that you have to wear those multiple hats and understand how cyber essentially weaves its way through everything you do. As in-house counsel, as general counsels in particular, what we are going to be doing is the same kind of push that we've been doing for diversity, the same kind of push we've been doing for cost resources, right, for project billing. You've seen a huge change. I know a lot of you have seen the pressure if you're with outside law firms about general counsels demanding better service, 
more focused service at cost because at the end of the day, it's about limited resources and priorities. So the same message is frankly for the outside counsel to help us, prove to us that you have the smarts that you're gonna shortcut the line, which is not straight, but that line to get from here to there, one in the planning stage, two in the response stage, three in the remedial stage. For your own organizations, be the person who's the change agent. If, you're, you're all, if your law firm is not getting the message, walk away from this conference and make it a point to make sure that you get with the decision makers and present the business case for your law firm as to why you need to basically do this. So Chris, let me ask you, one, we see again and again in surveys that chief information security officers routinely identify insider threats as one of the most um, scary things and one of the most concerning things. And what do, you, what do you think companies should do to address the potential of insider threats? I, I would recommend uh, three ideas. The first one, we, we've heard a bit about um, the import of the banners that we all see and don't pay attention to when we log in. But that daily reminder is very important should something occur downstream uh, where we can show that uh, we have the affirmative acknowledgement by the employee of the company's ability to share data with the government. So I think that banner is important. The content of the banner uh, is equally important. The second component um, is training and, and hopefully you know, not just the click through training exercise on a computer uh, that we all kind of um, don't really read the content of and don't pay attention to, but training through actionable means. We've started a, a program with our security organization of constructing messages that could be spam, that could contain malware, just to see how many employees will actually click the link. You'd be amazed at how many employees actually click the link. But that training, uh, that real-time reinforcement uh, goes a long way in changing the behaviors that ultimately help protect the organization from a cybersecurity perspective as well. Uh, and I think the, um, uh, the final component um, it really comes down to uh, engaging employees in a positive way, particularly in our sector, where one of our core responsibilities as an entity, as an enterprise, is the protection of the bulk electric system the protection of the distribution system. So I think having those uh, clarion calls to the organization helps as well. So I think we've gone from, I think several years ago, the FBI director said companies are either companies that have been hacked, have been hacked and don't know they've been hacked, or will be hacked. And I think we've now, we're now at a place where it's companies have been hacked and are going to be hacked again. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what happens during a cyber incident. And Carter, I'd like to start with you about if you could talk about some of the challenges that you faced, the legal challenges uh, that you faced in managing the breach at Target. Yeah, hacked again is... A Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there are, certain, there the are certain things that show up in your ray line when you get a note, and if the ending says breach, that causes people at Target to tremble at still even today. Um, so a number of things I think that are important um, to consider in the midst of a breach. One is um, we've heard a lot uh, throughout the presentations this morning and, and early this afternoon about notification. And I think um, we as lawyers tend to uh, almost harken back to law school. Here are the set of facts. Here's the body of law. Here's where they intersect. My job is to frankly try to lead somebody within the organization to make an informed decision and, and, and try to bring those things to life for whatever direction they're going. And at least I'll speak to with our breach event. Um, the information flow is remarkably slow. I mean, when you, and almost by definition, once you learn that you have, you are the point of breach, that's a surprise. And it, one, and so there's almost no information other than, okay, I mean, I, I looked at a computer screen, literally, and saw the letter S and was, our lead forensic investigator said, that's not supposed to be here. And that's how you find out, and then, but at that moment, you don't understand, I mean, you don't, you don't know precisely scope. And frankly, the timing around a forensic investigation takes, a, it take, it, depending on the size of your network, and for one like ours with trillion events a day, it takes a long time to go. So what, what ultimately what that means is you have to help counsel your, your, your team and your clients around expectations related to a forensics investigation. Second part of that is, is 
adding more people, adding more resources doesn't necessarily help. In fact, it ought, we spent time explaining that actually slows it down because you can appreciate that as we are getting, in our case, very publicly um, questioned about what happened and we're trying to do our best to explain, you're working with an incomplete information set. And that's very frustrating for, for many, including me. Um, so I think that you need to be prepared for that. You need to, and the experience that you as council can bring to be able to share that both before and during, that can help at least try to keep, keep the teams focused on what, what they can do. Um, I think another thing is, um, under, uh, there was a question asked in the last panel about cloud computing. And it's one thing if you own and contain your data but ever more increasingly you're seeing, whether it's moving to the cloud or just service providers, that data lies somewhere else. And what, how do you get access to it? When you find out, when you get information from them that says they had an event, and you want to you wanna understand what your now obligations are and what the scope is, how do you get access to that? And frankly, whatever the contract says, you can almost be assured in today's day and environment that there's a legal curtain that will come down even from your best partner, much less somebody who really doesn't do business with you frequently, how will you navigate that? How should you think about that? How can you be helpful around intersecting with somebody who's got data that is critical to you in terms of making decisions? Where will you under, understand where that is? And frankly, again, the direction where I see the enterprise is going is increasing that gets shifted off speed. And frankly, they won't be anxious is my experience to allow anybody in for the same reasons we wouldn't. You don't know what happened. And so I would just encourage you to be thinking about both contractually and, and how you intersect with others outside of your strict control and environment. What about um, interacting with law enforcement, uh, either before a breach or during a breach? What's your, what are your views on that? I'll start with you, Chris. Um, so we are uh, participants of the electricity ISAC and have been for quite some time. And that has proven uh, very beneficial for the information sharing across the sector that we, that we rely on, quite frankly. Because there could be some issues occurring in another part of the country that we wouldn't know about otherwise. So between the ISAC, uh, between the active participation by our security uh, organization, many of whom are FBI alums, which helps, uh, in their contacts with the Joint Terrorism Task Force, forces, plural, locally, uh, those uh, information streams are, are very important, I think. And should an incident occur, we know whom to call. Angie? You know, one common theme that sort of underruns all of these discussions and, and this entire issue is be prepared to be taken completely out of your comfort zone. Um, so there are certain things that are ingrained into us from legal training with respect to that dynamic between private sector and the government, particularly the enforcement agencies and regulatory agencies that have tremendous power over us, um, by, be it oversight or enforcement or, or otherwise. But the recognition with respect to the cyber area in particular is they are as much your partners as anybody else in terms of stakeholders because everybody is interdependent upon each other. Um, over 90% of the critical infrastructure is in the hands and control of the private sector. And yet we absolutely need the government's help. And it's got to be sooner so that we can start out closer to being on the same page than when we're in the throes of a breach or trying to basically talk to the government folks, um, you know, in terms of remedial about what the liabilities are. Um, so being out of your comfort zone is a really key thing. I think we can't, we can't afford not to partner and to be talking with all of the government, in particular law enforcement, because there are a lot of lessons learned that you can share with us. A lot of the things that you see in terms of the most egregious types of behavior or the indicators. Um, there are a lot of tools available, frankly, for the private sector in order to engage, not just directly, but perhaps on the edges in terms of the dialogue that has to be ongoing. So the ISACs are one. Um, a recent, uh, thanks to the, I forget, pardon, I forget the actual presidential executive order number, but. Um, there is a new creature out there called the ISAUS, because uh, we love acronyms, right? Um, but those are, those are in recognition that this dialogue, the conversation is extending beyond the, the sectors that were identified in PDD 63. There now actu there's act actually an ISAUS for the legal services. Um, it's being essentially helped by one of the established ISACs, the financial services, in order to make sure that they have 
the ways to get people more comfortable to at least have the discussion. And so it's a journey. So to your direct question, I think there absolutely needs to be meet me halfway so we can at least start talking without, without forgetting but, but pushing aside the curtain of fear that I think a lot of lawyers have about, well, what happens if, if my board finds out that I'm actually in conversations on a regular basis with the FBI? Um, you ought to have that discussion with your board. You have to have your discussion with your senior manager. Explain why you're doing it. Uh, because that's the only way we're going to get to where we really need to get as a, as a nation. Yeah, I'd like to jump in too because, um, again, we've been we've been envisioning that we we're, we're going to be proactive in talking. And I just want to, you know, for those that aren't familiar with our event, I remain grateful to law enforcement to this minute. We didn't call them; they called us. So it's another thing to be prepared for, which is what if you get that call. Um, and I can remember we got it at late at night on a Thursday. I didn't recognize it then. I didn't, wasn't in contact, but it was, I can distinctly remember to this day, Friday evening at seven o'clock, walking into a friend's house for supper and getting email traffic up from my team about secret service and security. And I was like, wait a minute. I mean, you don't, I don't thankfully get those emails very frequently, but, but they contacted us. And in terms of um, sharing information, um, it, was, it was imperative for us. I mean, this is back to you don't know what you don't know when this is all starting to break. And for example, given what we started to learn about our attack vector, it was very concerning that there might be insider either help or assistance or something. And government entities bring tools and capacities and knowledge and intelligence that you don't have access to that can be very helpful, again, in trying to focus efforts and certainly gain some share of um, mental relief that, one, you're, getting, you're making ground in terms of closing off the threats. But I would, I would suggest that's something to be aware of as well um, in terms of, of working with government agencies. It was very helpful for us. Chris? And to close out the thought, um, we've had the, the benefit of conducting, I think three at this point, uh, exercises involving um, Planned injects that that uh, that essentially mimic an entity taking down a part of the grid, and in each of those exercises, we had our government partners, federal, state, local, involved in those exercises, involved in the planning, so that we could literally practice the effort of contacting um, the regulatory authorities that we needed to practice and needed to contact should an event actually occur. So that partnership, to your point, not just on the notification, but on the actual uh, planning and drilling and exercising is invaluable. Yeah, and I want to add one more thing, because it was mentioned this morning very f in the very first keynote speech. I think we need to be thinking, my personal view is I think we need to be thinking as a community, and, and you as lawyers can help out in terms of thinking about this from a risk value proposition, but taking the long view in terms of working with law enforcement, in terms of eliminating or under, and understanding threats. Because I think each of us left to our own sandboxes can do terrific things, but it, it becomes incredibly difficult to really attack your entire ecosystem. And as we see the threat landscaping changing, and I'm talking about, again, this red to green, in terms of events, they're not, they're disproportional, and in terms of the sophistication of the threat actors today, they're compressing towards red. Our criminal, well, it might be on one side on the slide, that criminal element is awful, a lot, a lot, their, their methods, when we compare notes with law enforcement and the defense sector, they're awfully tight to nation state actors these days. My, my, my point is if you take the long view as a community and figuring out how do we think about interdiction, I think it's incumbent upon us to, you know, be partnering with law enforcement. So one other question I have, I think this is something that also has evolved over time. And, um, I remember several years ago, companies were very, very concerned about keeping the fact of a data breach completely confidential so that it didn't get out either to the public or customers or the media. I think that seems to have changed. And I'm, I wonder if any one of you wants to address, um, A, the importance of having kind of a communication strategy ready to go in the event of a breach. and and whether you agree with me that companies are, I, my, my sense is there's less of a stigma uh, than there used to be just because now so many people have been breached. Um, so anyone who would like to address that. 
all eyes on me, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, we haven't had that experience, but I can talk about the planning. Um, so when, when we uh, uh, consider, uh, I think a part of the, the strategy that goes into the planning in advance um, is recognizing the timing of when notifications need to occur. So in our sector, we have a requirement to submit a form to DOE within the first hour of an event. We have requirements now at the state level to notify those authorities within six hours of an event. In spending the time now to, to understand um, what needs to happen in what sequence is all of the forensic work that Carter just described is happening in the background is very important for a company to know. And something that I think, quite frankly, a lot of law firms can help us with. Um, so I do think uh, in one instance, um, you know, that, that transparency about the, the fact of an event happening is in some ways forced upon us. But it's a, it's a good thing because we need to, to share that information as promptly as possible in most instances. Angie? And so I would just amplify um, that concept and, and recognize, right, you, you will have legal disclosures, legally mandated disclosures. So it's incumbent upon you, depending on what your organization is or what sector you are, to understand what those are. That's part of your basic job. The other piece of it is recognizing, particularly if you're in-house, what it means to your company with respect to your relationships with your external stakeholders in terms of disclosing and managing that because that is equally as important as making sure that you remain legally compliant. And that also, one, you can plan that ahead of time so that you understand how you need to work with your communications group, how you need to work with your board, how you need to work with the rest of your senior management, and how you understand your customers in terms of disclosing it. And you do have an obligation to manage that so that, in fact, you can represent your organization in the way that your organization wants to be seen as being honest and candid with their stakeholders about these types of really critically Im impacting events. Yeah. Can, I, uh, can I just add one more aspect to that? Um, in our situation, we had uh, public disclosures by virtue of state statutes, et cetera. And so I, my answer to the question would be absolutely have crisis communications as part of your planning that's not why I say it in part. I mean, well, I should take that. I clearly would say it for that reason alone. But understand uh, or be wary or be at least uh, uh, mindful that whether or not you've got those obligations, if you're bringing in a forensics expert or a firm or you've got even just partnerships that you have to disclose that aren't going to be made public, operational security around this leaks. Um, it, it is amazing. How many, how many people get looped in so fast to try to, in, in, a, in a thoughtful, helpful way, but, but all of a sudden it's expert, that this, that it, I, it caught me off guard in, in, any, in any different ways, how many people and how fast the population of, that knew about parts or all of this just exploded. And so, and, and frankly, I, I, we've encountered other situations where it, it, there's not a public facing thing per se, but. Just think about the forensics teams you would bring in, for example. How do you think about managing information flow and operational security? Because that can get out and that can lead to um, other things that will be questioned in public or in the press, and that gets you back to crisis communications. Which is very difficult in the age of social media. Mm -hmm. So Chris, let me ask you, let's assume now that the incident is over, um, and to the best of your company's ability, the intrusion or the breach has been contained. What, is, what do you do now? What is your role now? What issues do you have to face now? Uh, how does your focus change? What do you do to prepare for the next cyber breach? So uh, from the, the legal team, I think, has three uh, responsibilities at that point. Um, to oversee recovery, to help whenever we can, however we can, with the actual recovery of the systems or network or applications uh, that were impacted by the cyber, cyber event. Uh, root cause analyses. So to the extent that we can apply the privilege to those analyses, we definitely need to have that conversation. Um, and then finally, discovery. The next panel will be a panel of regulators. We know in advance that we will have um, requests for information from, I would have to guess, at least a half a dozen uh, enforcement authorities after the recovery has occurred. And we need to be prepared. So we need to you know, ensure that um, litigation holds are placed appropriately, we need to ensure that um, uh, the need to know circle is appropriately limited. We have to be prepared for uh, the enforcement wave that's likely to come. What about um, cybersecurity insurance? What are your views about 
whether that's important to have, uh, whether companies should have it, and what kind of, without getting into the details of insurance policies, what kind of insurance should you have? Angie? It's afraid you were going to ask me on that. Um, I, no, it's <laughs> Anyone okay. can answer. Yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. Um, I just wanted to amplify one other thing, which is um, you, I think the legal department also needs to do lessons learned um, after a breach because ultimately, again, your battle plan has already been decimated. Um, everybody's essentially all a Twitter, not to make a pun, but uh, ultimately what you want to do is you want to learn from that experience. You want to learn from others' experience, but especially if it's happened to you, what you want to do is pick yourself up and sort of figure out what went right figure out what went wrong, and then sort of role play in your head what might the next scenario or situation essentially present that you haven't thought about. So what is the unknown? Um, with respect to cyber insurance, so obviously as a risk mitigation measure, uh, insurance is, a, is always one of the tools in the kit that you should always consider. Um, they've come a long way. Uh, it used to be, I'd say, maybe as recently as five years ago, the products that were out there were so riddled with loopholes, exceptions, waivers, that it was really, really difficult, particularly even if you've gotten past the first obstacle of having a common taxonomy to understand your risk management group or the lawyers, uh, exactly what the policy says, if it's on a manuscript policy. Um, I think we've, gone, we've come a long way from there, but we're still not quite there. Um, you're incumbent, just like you would in looking at any insurance policy, I think, to understand what you're actually covering. And if you can't articulate the risk that you believe your organization faces by the insurance policy, then I'm hard pressed to figure out how you will understand what the policy actually covers. And so that's gonna correlate to how much are you willing to pay for what are, whatever the insurance company is actually asking for that policy. So it's a, it's a very individually based assessment that you have to do, but I think it is clearly one of the tools that you have as a company or an organization to consider um, to try and mitigate. But remember, that doesn't substitute for all the planning and the response mechanisms and the remediation measures because that's operational. The insurance is only there to basically pay out some kind of money for some kind of damage or consequence. So that's only gonna cover part of the leftovers of what happens. So recently in the news, we've seen um, some, some news about historical breaches that were just recently discovered. Um, any one of you can answer this. Um, how, how is that different? How is that different in the way you handle it when you discover in 2016 that you had a breach in 2014? And I'll let anyone who wants to take that answer it. Or not. <laughs> I, we, we actually talked about that. And look, it's, it's very easy for us to play you know, Monday morning quarterback. We, who knows what happened? Um, we, we did find it curious, and you would, you would be kind of blind not to note that it was very clear the, the incident happened in 2014 um, for the company at, at issue. Um, who knows what happened internally? Uh, there, we have to just assume that there are reasons, and I'm sure the media will help us along in terms of speculating what exactly was going on, going on behind the curtain. So I, I think, generally speaking, if you find out uh, from whatever source internally that there has been a historical breach that you were unaware of, then you essentially go into response plan mode um, because it depends on how you found out, what it was. You go through the same steps as you would for something that you find out perhaps a little bit more precipitously and more impactfully um, when you're walking into a friend's house for dinner. You have the luxury of a little bit more time, but not really because you still, once, you're kno once you know something's happened, you need to respond appropriately. So I want to leave some time for questions, but before I do that, I'd like to ask each of the panelists to answer one last question, which is, um, do you have any advice for the audience about what not to do? And Chris, I'll start with you. What not to do? Um, do nothing. It, it, we can't do nothing. Um, so, it, and it starts locally. I think it starts, for those who, of us who are inside council, it starts with our leadership teams. It starts with, with pressing them to, uh, to participate in drills themselves. Whatever that disaster recovery plan looks like, however you can package it so that that team understands the leadership team has to be engaged. Yeah, and I, I, I guess I would uh, echo that and, and just add a little bit more color. In, in terms of what can't you do, it, it, you can't, if this area is unfamiliar to you or the situation or risk, you can't default to no. Um, it's not an acceptable path forward in terms of shutting down information flow, capturing all of the work, 
it just doesn't happen that way and it doesn't advance the ball. You have the opportunity as council in particular to be either an accelerator or a complete stop sign. And what, what from my perspective, really, what's really helpful is to work through the different scenario planning to understand what tasks are important, what risks, frankly, should be taken under the circumstances. And so, again, it's not a, it's not a default to know. That's not a, that won't be acceptable to management, and it, and it, it, it makes it harder, actually, for in-house people to do their jobs and try to re be reflective on which direction to be most circumspect about. Angie? Don't try to do it alone. You have got to make sure that you know what you don't know and who is going to be a partner, who is going to be a resource, who is going to help you. Whether you're internal, you have to be able to know who your CISO is. You have to know, essentially, if you can't translate and you can't articulate what the technical terms are or how to essentially put it in a concise package to, to communicate to your stakeholders, find someone who can speak the lingo, whether it's internal, whether it's external. But this is now a team sport. There's not a single one of us that can essentially do everything that needs to be done or identify everything that needs to be identified by themselves. So we have about 10 minutes for questions from the audience, and I think we have some past microphones if anyone has a question. Don't be shy. Yes, sir. This is Director Carter. I know you're probably sick of this because, unfortunately, you get to be the abject lesson. But um, uh, my question is more in the form of sort of fill in the blank. If, if from your perspective, at, at what point could you say, if only we, meaning your OGC, we had done X last year, when this breach happened, this would have been so much, I won't say easy, because it wouldn't be more manageable, or I could have handled this better if we'd only done that. Is there such a thing that you could fill in that blank? Um, maybe. I mean, I don't, you know, when I think operationally, um, it was, the events happened so fast it got overwhelming. So I'm going to, I'm going to give a little bit and then I'm going to walk my statement back about um, maybe. Um, to Angie's point, it, there wasn't, um, we didn't have in advance assembled the armada of legal talent both internally and externally, that we ended up needing to capitalize on once we found ourselves both during and after the event. Um, it would be hard for me to imagine in the abstract because we do, we try to be thoughtful about where our resources are and looking over the horizon where we see um, risks to our company. Um, it would have been unimaginable for me to have, have thought about how to, have, we would have needed that sort of, the, the, the long strata of, of, of legal talent that we used when the breach happened. Um, but I do think it's something that was mentioned earlier in terms of trying to really understand, not in the abstract, but in, in concert with the senior executive team and with the board of directors, how do we want to really address this, how do we want to address information security risks? How do, how do we collectively think about it? How, are we, how do we feel about being set up? How do we compare to our sector, you know, people other in our sector, that, that I think you could have, all, I mean, we, we would have been well served to have more of a common, having a common understanding, dialogue, and it would have served not just, okay, what are you working through the risks, but how are we, as, you know, there's a, there's a lot that you can't control when these things happen. But again, when you, can, when you can have that sort of dialogue in advance at that very senior level, just to, I mean, and I'm, I'm, I'm being purposely abstract because I know the retail sector is different from the defense sector, different than the energy sector, different than the financial sector. And I think there are companies that do this particularly well. But frankly, I, I, don't, I don't think from an operational legal standard, you know, boy, if we'd had this in place, I mean, there are small things. Contracts, we mentioned that. I mean, again, you can't control a lot of things, but you can control what exactly do the, you know, for us it was, and how to notify the banks, and, the, and the, you know, when we when recognize this was a financial component. You can have that at your fingertips. You can have done the analysis, what is required, when is it required, and so you're not also at the, in, you know, as you're getting crushed by media, trying to flip through that as well and trying to really digest and understand that. So I think that um, that's a hint. We, we were thankful that we didn't have that. Um, the other thing, though, that, but that reminds me of um, one of, again, it's a smaller, 
it's a smaller technical piece, but back to forensic experts or other contracts, who's got them on, a lot of companies will have on, already on retainer entities to come in and be helpful. I mean, some, sometimes it's required, but, but who's retained them? Is it, the, is it an outside counsel? Is it your law firm or is it your chief information security? Literally, who is it? And I would suggest that you might want to give thought if it's not somebody with a legal imprimatur, they have alternate sets of retainers because, again, you may, that may be a significant issue once you start to engage that, again, you will go fast and full force. And if you're thinking about how to be prescriptive in terms of now being the lawyer in terms of, hey, these communications we want to try to maintain a privilege around, that's a small but turns out to be a, could be a critical component as, as time flows on. Sorry it wasn't. I mean more, but it, um, I just think it was a lot of small things from a legal from a legal perspective, to be sure. Anyone else? We have time for at least a couple more questions. Yes. Thank you very much for coming and doing this panel. What are you seeing in industry in terms of formation of uh, incident response plans in two respects? First, uh, are you seeing that companies are taking their existing crisis management plan and just coming up with a cyber variation of that? Or are you seeing companies do a separate independent cyber incident response plan? That's the first question. Second part of the question, what are you seeing in terms of that plan scope? Uh, is the plan involving increasingly key suppliers, uh, vendors, uh, in, in addition to just the the organization itself and uh, is the practicing of that plan, not just with government uh, officials, but with uh, key supplier uh, or customer partners. Thanks. Whoever wants to answer? I'll take the first one. Sure. Um, I, I think the truth is, is uh, it, it's an issue of tailoring and scaling, right? Depending on your organization, if you have a crisis management plan, it seems sensible to me to make sure that at least the crisis management plan acknowledges that you also have an incident response plan. Or if you are a small organization, maybe you collapse it all into one and you have sort of addendum that basically deal with it. Um, or you have a template response plan of any sort, whether it's a crisis or, I mean, it really is an issue of understanding your organization and its DNA so that in fact, in fact it fits. Because the worst thing is to take a template off the internet if it's up in legalforms.com, right? And thinking, okay, here it is, check the box, I've done it. If you haven't essentially tailored it for your organization and if you haven't scaled it for what functions and capabilities you have in-house or have gotten on retainer out-house, I didn't mean to say that, <laughs> external, um, then, then in fact you're, you're not going to be as effective as you need to be when, when the moment comes. And to the second question, that's one of the lessons that we learned from the most recent uh, GRID exercise, the one that occurred in November of last year. Uh, it was the very point of we are not to, I've heard the, the cyber ecosystem mentioned before, and there are critical vendors who support us in operating our business. And so that was a lesson that we learned and are working down the path of making sure that by the time the next drill occurs in 2017, we'll have that much more fully addressed and those vendors participate with us. Uh, what we learned additionally was uh, it's not just the cyber. In our world, there are a lot of physical assets that may be impacted by a cyber intrusion. So we have to be prepared to have spares in place. So it's, it, it, we're, we're, we're getting there, definitely maturing uh, those, those response plans. Yeah, just to, to marry the two up, one of the, th one of the things that we've encountered and that I've seen in industry is, and this is where you, you can be helpful, as a, particularly outside counsel, striking that right balance between having a, you have to have a plan, you have to have some depth to it, but trying to, trying to plan out, try to scenario plan everything cyber is not helpful from my perspective. And so it, it'll be different for different companies, but I, that's where I would suggest you might find the, a very significant challenge, which is how much is enough? How much, how much it will give you guidance, but allow you to have flexibility in encountering things that I mean, ransomware wasn't being talked about three years ago. I mean, it's, I mean, you will see this continue to evolve and how do you, how do you strike that balance in your plan? So I think we have time for one more question. Um, I saw somebody over here, and then Steve. Um, Go ahead. Um, 
I'm just curious, some general guidelines from a legal perspective uh, that you all have on triaging incidents, cyber incidents, right? So obviously you have it, certain disclosures that are required under state laws, depending on what industries you're in, but you know, just basic questions. Okay, say it's not something that's already mandatorily um, required to be disclosed, you know, you know, how do you know when you need to call you know, law enforcement? You know, are there any sort of general guidelines you guys have found outside of sort of the basic regulatory um, you know, and statutory requirements? I think for us, we err on the side of, of um, communicating out. So even if there isn't a formal requirement, if it's a close call, we'll still notify the, the EISAC. Because as we've heard before, um, intelligence law enforcement may know things that we don't. Steve, you had one last question? I sort of have a, a wrap-up question for the, for the panel. For, for those of us who are in the government, are there things that the federal government can do that would make your companies and, and similarly situated companies more comfortable with the partnership with the federal government or with sharing information with the government? Are there, are, are there more things that we can do to get you comfortable? So continue promulgating things like the ISACs and the ISALs and keep having conferences like this. Just like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think we're out of time, so thank you so much for coming, and thanks to our great panel. Hope everyone had a